check, check. So I'd like to welcome everybody. The music you're hearing, can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Okay. This music you're hearing is music that was written by Jan Kahn. She was a flute player and a classical guitar player and a folk singer and a writer of a musical. And so we're going to start our uh, presentation with uh, the first uh, tune that she wrote because, as you may know, she uh, was the primary explorer of 60 miles of Jewel Cave, which is in Custer, South Dakota. And uh, she would go in about every two weeks and sometimes stay for two days underneath the, there or three days. And uh, at one point, it took so long for to get from this part of the cave, the beginning of the cave, to where they had, had new explorations to do. It was taking so long to get to the new explorations just by traveling. Holt, 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 Holt. No, no, please. And so then, they, they, so it got so long across that they had an elevator put in later, about halfway through the job. Uh, but uh, we're going to go into other things, and I'm welcome to anyone who wants to say something during this in the family wants to, because I have my family on the front row. And we're, so we're going to start. This first piece we're going to hear, I'd like to listen to most of all of it, please, is uh, what she wrote. It's called The Sunlit Approach uh, from a suite that she wrote called The Underground Suite. So we want to listen to this before we start into some, just this is a nice piece. Just we'll listen to part of it. Okay, so when they were young, uh, you can go ahead and change the slide. When they were young, much younger than this, they, they grew up together in near Bethesda, Maryland. And they would first, Janny was climbing door jams when she was a kid. Then she was climbing chimneys of the roof of the house. And then she was going out with Herbie. Uh, they became close right at the beginning. <laughs> and they climbed bridge abu abutments. And then later they were formed the climbing club of the Potomac River. I think it's, a, it's called the Potomac Hiking Club now. It was started, uh, well, I guess in the 30s. And it's still going. And uh, one fellow who was in that club got real interested uh, with, in Janny and Herbie. And they started the hike, the hike, this climbing club, and he's doing a, another, we're going to see part of Chad's work in this show. So what they did was they got this van, and they outfitted it uh, with, I think, a wood stove in it. They lived in a, the parking lot. They ended up in Custer, South Dakota. They traveled on, in this van from California. to. They did, were not interested in the huge, you know, big stuff in Yosemite. They went to Big Bend. It was okay. They did other places, too. Uh, 
they climbed at the Tetons. Uh, Janie was the first woman to, cl to go across, and Herbie was with her, across the Tetons, climbing all the way across them. And she was also, we'll see later here, a picture of her when she climbed Devil's Tower. So they lived here, and now we're going to have a poem. And we want to read this poem of Janie's called The Brimming Cup. So now, change. Can you see it? Okay, I'll read it. Life is a brimming cup. It overflows with ecstasy and joyous wonder. It lifts the heart and tugs the body skyward. For how can such delight be found in anything that's still earthbound? In youth, the brimming cup is filled with eagerness to break the bonds of all that's known. No goal lies beyond the grasp of a strong young hand. No backward glance to slow us in our haste. No time to ponder, no time to waste. In middle life, the cup is brimming still. Priorities are set and shortcuts tried. What to do and what with sad reluctance lay aside. Next. But what of age? Can memory still fill the cup clear to the brim? Can loss and pain and illness be ignored? Surely then the cup will have to drain and only the bitter, bitter residue of dregs remain. No, the cup of life must always overflow. The heart must lift to beauty as before. I've learned the knack that fills my, my vessel up. It's easy. Be content with a smaller cup. <laughs> my thimble runneth over. Let's listen to Jenny sing this song, The Spinning Blue Ball. Perhaps it isn't where we come from or the opportunities we have, but the way we look at the world that makes the difference. Howdy, stranger, where have you been? What have you done and where have you come from? By the look of you, you're something special. Your work and your fun have never been humdrum. Do you come from a special place, a privileged member of the human race? Wherever you come from, I want to go. Wherever you come from, I want to know. I was born on a spinning blue ball in space, and the wind sang my lullaby. I climbed from my crib on a summer's day and looked the world in the eye. I looked above to a shifting cloud. I looked below to the sea. I took a breath and I said out loud, this spinning ball is for me. You belong to me, blue spinning ball. Spinning, spinning, spinning ball. You belong to me, blue spinning ball. And I belong to you. I quenched my thirst from a mountain stream. Okay. I Let's go to the next. The so this says, so a little about Janie's growing up. Check this hairdo. That is Janie in the back with the curly fro. My mom is seated with her mo uh, my mom, and that's my grandmom. So they look very traditional for the day, but Janie doesn't. So it says, when she was in high school, the administration of the school told her she had to stop wearing the same clothes to school every day. She was not into fashion, so she just changed schools. <laughs> okay. When Janie was young, middle school age, she fell in love with the flute, but her family could not afford to buy one, so she cut a broomstick to length and fashioned pretend keys and memorized the fingerings. She was ready to go when she got her real flute.
So one more story about this picture before you change it. I just told Dan and, and Doug. She told me one time that she, she would go out and they lived, they, they, the, the land they ended up buying was right on the edge of Custer State Park. So there was thousands of acres of wilderness out behind. And she would go out and I did it, went, went on a lot of scrambles with her. There were these little out, uh, rock outcroppings and she could easily get to the top of that. She was a totally, you know, professional <laughs> rock climber and we would, you know, climb up there and she'd say, this is where I used to come. I'd come bring my flute and practice and everything it was so nice, she said. But I always made sure I, I brought three kinds of paper with me. I said, yeah. He, he says, yes, uh, uh, note paper for writing the music down, uh, letters, you know, letter, you know, stationery to write it, and toilet paper. <laughs> Okay, let's go. Jan and Herb started with a very small carbon footprint way before that was even a term, early 50s. They kept it small and simple with humor always. And there they are. Yeah, they lived in a parking lot of, at Custer State Park where, where the, for about two years in this thing. So they, they were called, oh, well, let's go to the next slide. Oh, so... When they finally did decide to have a permanent home, they built this. And this is, they called it the Con Cave. They, their last name is Con, so they called it the Con Cave. And it's about the same size as that truck, <laughs> a little bit bigger maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's about, uh, yeah, just two, uh, there was a bed, there was a door, as you came in the door, you had to do this, duck down and lift up. <laughs> to get in. Then when you got there, you know, you're like this, and there's a, there's a, a fire, a, you know, wood stove right here, and a, a chair and stuff all over the, you'll see pictures of it a little bit, and a bed that was kind of up high. And one time, I'll tell you this family secret about, I'll tell you a family secret. She said, uh, one time we were there, Lana and I were there in the concave. I rarely went in the concave. Uh, that was their bedroom, basically. We didn't, we didn't, they, there's, you'll see another place she built where we visited more, but we were in, she said, I want to tell you all, come, come in here, I want to tell you something. So we're standing in the concave like this. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, and you need to know this. See, there's the bed. This, this, is, this is, you know, I, I ca this is the bed post, but I call it the gold post. The gold is under the bed right there. That was the secret that we knew, and actually discovered it later, you know, another story. <laughs> but it was a, a rock, they built it. First, they were gonna build it as a tool shed, but they decided, oh, it looks perfect, we'll just move in. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's a picnic table there, and that was in the snow. We'll see another picture of it later. So let's go on. Thank you, so guys, so much. All right, dirt baggers are people that forsake the comforts of home and material belongings to pursue their passion. What was his passion? Climbing, and there's Herbie. Next. Can you read that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know what this is, Devil's Tower. Next slide. Here she is with one of her climbing friends, who was Jane, I think, after becoming the first woman to climb Devil's Tower. And that was interesting because she climbed it and came down, and there was somebody there with, at the bottom. I'm not sure exactly the story. Well, yeah, go ahead. It started with, yeah. She climbed it with Herbie first time, the two of them. And so she was the first woman up it. And when they came down, people had been gathering to watch them come down. And she heard some man say, uh, well, she had to have his help to get up there, obviously. She's just a woman. So she got Jane, and she said, okay, we're going to do it, just the two of us. So somebody's waiting at the bottom to say, well, it can't be that hard if two women can do it. It was actually the same person that said both things. Okay. Oh, oh, and did that, oh never mind. It says the Indian name for the uh, Devil's Tower. That's, an, that's, a, that's a white man's name. It's actually called the Bear Lodge or the Bear's Teepee, and they had bear claws on it. So they never liked that part. So, so this is where they spent their time. Yeah. This is the uh, Black Hills. This is the needles of the Black Hills. Uh, they're called the Cathedral Spires, and they are the home of over 200 first descents for Jan and Herb. Um, one of the 
and they and they uh, they mapped each one the routes they took they wrote them down and more recently there's been a, a lady climber that's trying that's trying to reclimb all the climbs they climbed they can't find the, the other, about four or five of them that they mapped but they don't know where they are so they're still looking for those climbs but the climbers today use their map I was talking to a climber just the other day uh, just out in Colorado and he said oh yeah I've seen Jan and Herb's name on all the climbing manual the you know the guidebooks but that's that that's right. It was like the late 40s, early 50s. Yeah. They had hemp rope and tennis shoes. Yeah. They weren't using the modern t climbing <laughs> equipment, and, they, and they, never, they never really had a mishap. They couldn't. Uh, because the, the rope would, you know, they just couldn't. They were so careful. And there have been, vid I've seen videos of, of modern-day climbers trying to reproduce the climbs they made oh. with equipment and all the, all the techniques, and, and they couldn't couldn't do it and uh, they were very careful they worked together very closely and uh, kind of revolutionized climbing in a certain way this is Herb on Lincoln's nose of Rushmore this was a summer job for him for 13 years it was two weeks of the summer just a summer job they never had nine to five jobs <laughs> they just took small part-time jobs <laughs> and this some ways was in strict opposition to their strict environmentalist philosophy of doing no harm to the environment, but uh, Herbie couldn't resist that. They, they didn't like Rushmore and uh, didn't really like Crazy Horse either, which is the same thing, although I did get to go up on Crazy Horse with Jannie. So, you know, they... They didn't even have a well. What was his job? The uh, they were, he was uh, uh, filling in uh, cracks uh, and he said the hardest place to fill and repair was uh, Theodore Roosevelt's eyes, the glasses. Is it, you were going to say? Uh, that they didn't even drill a well at their place. So they didn't have any water. They had no water. No. They had to bring all their water. I helped them bring in, packing it on my back from a spring somewhere, carrying like eight gallons of water on my back. Holy cow. They didn't have running water or electricity in the no. concave. The whole time. And... Uh, but when we went there, it was like we, were, we never were in need of anything except a bath. That's the only thing. But, oh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the joke. I can't resist. Yeah. Janny's story. I said, well, how do you take a bath? And somebody says to Janny, how do you take a bath? What do you, what do, you do? Okay. 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 I'll let him on. Okay, so Janny says this. This is the way I take my bath. I get a, you know, some warm water and a cloth. And I start at the top, and I wash as far as possible. And then, after that, I, you know, get the washcloth again and start at the bottom and wash far up as far as possible. And then I wash the possible. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> so Herbie, uh, Herbie had a lot of talent. Uh, Jenny was her talent was out because she sang, and she was very well known in the community and as a singer and. A, performer and Herbie was more of a hermit really than any person I've ever known he stayed at home the only time he went out is unless he was climbing or visiting climbers or going to the cave the rest of the time he stayed home he was a, a brilliant mathematician and uh, was a, had studied physics I think or physicist he was a physicist or something close to that and he drew these drawings okay next okay here comes one of Jenny's favorite songs I'm just a little foothold the way up on the peak, and no one ever visits me or listens when I speak. I sometimes get discouraged, for I'm all alone, you see. I'm just a little foothold, and nobody cares for me. But one day came a mountaineer who climbed with skill and grace. He put his great big climbing boot right square up on my face. The words he whispered to me then have filled my heart with song. God bless you, little foothold. You're just where you belong. Okay, next slide. So here's a painting that my grandmother drew of the concave, and it makes it look quite romantic and beautiful. And she was a wonderful painter. Okay? 
This is the front door of the concave, which was what I was talking about. You go in like that. And, uh, but it had a beautiful little, what was that little sign? Reuben, didn't you find that sign? You found it, Claire. What'd you find? What'd it say? Oh, it says, uh, her little sign on the door said, creative minds are seldom tidy. <laughs> she said, I love nature. Why wouldn't I mind having some of it in my house? <laughs> Next slide. Uh, they, had, they could get the wood from the inside of the house. On the, that's, that's to the right. And go ahead. That's her, that's her in the cave, in her, on, sitting on her bed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she was a busy, and you know, she was a busy person. One time, I know this is going to take forever. One time, she was being honored. She got honored. One time, this is a story. This is a good one. She was being honored as the, uh, you know, hiker or environmentalist of the century. And this was not that long ago. And, and she said, I wonder which century. <laughs> Because she, she went the whole way. Uh, yeah, so that's, she was a busy, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll skip that story. It's not that great. Next one, please. Okay, so this is a garage. And uh, it was not good hope. And, I mean, you don't, these are not better homes than gardens places. <laughs> that Jeep uh, is a brown Jeep. And uh, it was called Willie. And uh, they named everything. And uh, I, got, I had been on several trips in it before and we were getting ready to go on another trip with it and I got in and I was sitting in the back and it was just just looked like that dirty terribly dirty and everything I looked up and on the roll bar bar there was a speaker on the roll bar a speaker like for the radio and I said that, that doesn't look right and I said Danny what I said is this a new Jeep she said yeah we don't tell anybody <laughs> it was just as dirty as the other one she said we believe in inconspicuous consumerism Next slide. <laughs> That's where they spent a lot of time. Jenny later, uh, Herb passed away about seven or eight years ago, and Jenny uh, was splitting wood way up to the end when she had to move out of the, with, well, it, it was in the end. She moved out of the cave. It's, it burned up one day. I won't tell you that whole story, but everybody's safe, and she's living somewhere else. But the concave is no more. But anyway, this is what she spent her time doing. Next one. Thank you, guys. What? Yeah. I love this picture. I just found it recently. That's her with the garage there in the snow. One time she got snowed in the concave, and it was a very wet snow really early in the, in the winter, and the snow was really up high. And she, she had to, you know, slowly get the door open. Herbie, I think, was around at that time, and they finally got it open, and then when she got open, she could get out. She couldn't walk in the snow because it was just like, you know, you couldn't walk on top of it, you sink down in it, and you can walk through it. And she said, okay, the snowshoes are not going to stay in the garage anymore. They go on the ceiling in the concave. Hardy people. Next. So these are the garages on the right with Willie, and there's another garage in the foreground for another car, and that was their w workshop. There'll be another picture of their workshop and the little swing they had up at the top of the hill. And I'm st we're standing up near the knot hole, which is a nice little, cute little cottage you'll see here, maybe. That's the knot hole. And th this is where she entertained guests. This is where she taught. Uh, there was a wood stove in it. We'll see, we'll take a good tour of this little place. So let's keep, there's Jenny, standing out in front of the knot hole. Okay, keep going, please. Another view of the porch. They built this by hand, even the gingerbread. They didn't have electricity. When Scott and I stayed there, this was our kitchen. Uh, the outside, yeah. yeah. And go ahead. That's the front door. She carved it. It's a nice piece of wood, and the treble cliff is, only, is the only thing left of the nice wood. The rest of it has been carved out. And I have, uh, we all probably have little plaques that she made of this that I have at my house, hanging at my house. That's her door. Next. There's the uh, reason that they built this cottage, the knot hole, was to, to display the map of the cave. 
because they had nowhere they could put this map. And this map is not complete. The cave is, I think, almost 200, it's 200 miles long. And I was in South Dakota, and I had uh, the perfect map to show. And I left it there by mistake. But the, she used to, at her cave show, she would start with this map, and she would open it up just so far. And there would be kind of like two paths. There was a be a, a entrance, and then down here there was the, that was the old entrance, and they had a new entrance. And when they first started working at the cave, it was only like a couple miles, or they, and they had not connected a route between that one and this one, and they wanted to connect somehow connect so they could come in this entrance and go out this one. And so she started working, and she says that she opens up the map like this. We were working, trying to find it, trying to find it, and they pushed it all the way out, and they never found it. But they explored 60 miles. Now, we're going to go in the cave in a little while, too, but we're going to take the knot hole in first. Okay, let's go. That's to the left as you walk in. Instruments everywhere, hung on, the, hung on everywhere. And keep going, please. Just a close-up. But that's a stained glass window made for that horn. <laughs> Next. There's Reuben and Jenny in the loft of the knot hole. And Claire coming in the back door, <laughs> which is a window <laughs> that you step onto a bench where you normally would sit to get in. And that's what you see there. So that was last summer when we visited. Okay. That's kind of a nice side view of the map. Next, we different see. Colors represent different levels. Right. Different colors or different levels. And then here's a close up, I think, of the map. Oh, that's Seth. And Janie's pointing out some things in the map, on the map. She came up with some wonderful names for every feature in the cave. Yeah, I've got a close up of some of the names. The next up. Here we go. Uh, 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 down here, Sinner's Reward. Uh, patchwork Boom, Lowlands, uh, Contortionist Delight, <laughs> The Oxbow Slip, uh, Hurricane Quarter, Bargain Basement, Pay Dirt Crawl, and the book I brought is, has all the details about that. As they explored, they were following wind. They knew the cave was big because they had measured the flow of wind and the volume of wind moving in and out of the cave. We're going to see the wind machine. So that's why it's called Hurricane Corner because there was especially a lot of wind right there. Next. Early days. Cave because they stopped mountain climbing or, you know, and went down into the cave. And uh, Janie said she loved it better uh, because they were just exploring new territory all the time. It was always some creative place that they were going to. And we're going to go in the cave very soon here, I think. There's the wind machine. They called it Annie. At, uh, Herbie designed it so that they could uh, measure the wind as it came out of the cave because that indicated how large the cave was. If you have a lot of wind, it's a large cave. And if you have continuous wind, I don't know all the details. But he figured this out. And there's another picture of some another part of it. Yeah, That's... Yeah, in the mouth. He's got it in the mouth. Next. <laughs> That's called Janny's Cranny. <laughs> and next, next. Okay, this is uh, me on the left, Janny, and that's Fred Leo. And then Herbie. <laughs> 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 and <laughs> we're getting ready to go on a scramble in the cave or just be lunking inside the cave. Yes, Anastasia. Yeah, for the government. It, was a, it is a national park. And if you go there, there's a museum. There are rangers there. And they've got their pictures up on the wall. Uh, and, yeah, the, yeah. And their clothes are in the museum. Oh, did I get it No, not anymore. Okay. They've, they've kind of, we, when we used to go, we were like, go with Janny. It was like, oh, Janny, oh, Janny. Yeah. And now it, it's not the same. <laughs> but anyway, we, we had a beautiful ride uh, into the cave. We had a fantastic time. And there's a picture of where we ended up one day. But we're going to just kind of 
Just imagine what it was like to go with them. I mean, they would just go, there would be a place, and you're going to go up that hole, into a hole right there, and there was like rocks and stuff, and Herbie would go, <laughs> and I would go. <laughs> <laughs> it was weird. Next one. Oh, that's because we're getting ready to hear the cave music. We're going to go in the cave now. Some nice pictures from the book here and other pictures that I had. And some, this is a piece that she wrote that's called uh, Stalactites. And she said it's a short piece because there weren't very many stalactites in the cave. In fact, the last couple pictures here are in wa or of water. There's hardly any water in the cave, like some. Okay. Water's a new discovery. Okay, press that. Okay, that last picture was the frozen waterfall. And uh, we had a story there where, where we were in there, Fred and Danny and Herb and I, and somebody was coming. They had a cave, caver's convention, and they were, everybody was climbing through the cave. Some people were. And this guy was coming this way, and Danny said, oh, turn off your lights. Turn off your lights. We'll hide. He we, we would have to find us. And uh, Herbie said, no. Can't do that. I, it was really odd. I never heard them ever disagree about anything, really. But that was a beautiful spot to be in. And it's not on, it's not on the tour guide. It's not on the, you can't, they, they made a tour that, you know, like you do in most, that this was not, it's not on the tour at all. Okay, let's go on. Now, this is cool. You can't really see this one very well. But this is a Mountie, a yeah, Mountie, <laughs> a, a ranger giving a talk. And Jenny when she would go into the cave and, and, the, and, the, rain, and the, mount, the rangers would see her, they would freeze up because they would get so nervous because they, they would say, oh, my gosh, we're just Janny, you know. And so she did this to take care of that situation. Next. <laughs> so she couldn't be recognized as a blonde. And so she could listen to him and, and be incognito. <laughs> Next. That's a great picture of Herbie. Yeah. Okay, next. Yeah, this is a special picture. That's Landon and me in the back top. Jenny and Herbie on their crappy little uncomfortable. <laughs> and Jenny in the front. And this was, I don't know what year this was. You were... 94. They had reached 100 miles. Jenny and Herbie stopped exploring, but they were always the first people that knew what the new explorers were doing. They, they called them and said, we got the blah, blah, blah. And no, two, in the, 2 in the morning, wouldn't matter. Jenny says, where'd you go to? Where'd you get to? And so that was a celebration of 100 miles. Next. It says, on the map, it's a tiny gap, but underground, it's a long way around. Next one, and I'll read what's over here to the right. Herb and Jan Kahn explored over 60 miles of new passages from 1959 to 1979, describing the cave as a crystal-lined wilderness. The Kahn's treasured the challenge of caving. Herb described that simply moving inside Jewel Cave required an ever-changing succession of maneuvers, varying from mountain climbing techniques to the undulation oozing of an earthworm. Next. They're modeling Patagonia clothes here. Uh, they were friends with the founder of the company. Yeah. And inspired them. That's they inspired it. him. Yeah. And next. That's their comfortable couch. That's their, co <laughs> that's their comfortable swing. <laughs> next. Okay, we're coming to the end. 
that's Jenny with her cat in the, in the concave, which is no longer. The cat just showed up. Yeah, so now she has a friend. So there's Jenny, and that's, that's our view of her that we think of. And now we've got one more thing to listen to and watch about this show, and it'll be over. So let's give this a go. And uh, we're going to have to have the sound up. As, it's really weird sound. So please. This is, this is the Hall of Fame of South Dakota. She's being honored. So I thought I would sing you a caving song as a little bit of variety. Everybody else just gave speeches. Once was a fellow bold and brave Sought out each and every cave Stout of heart but slim of chest He could slither with the best <laughs> Scale the domes and plumb the pits He would never call it quits but he had one quality the group could not abide. When cavers saw him coming, they'd run away and hide. He made such a racket when he opened up his mouth that the geese would fly north and the ducks would fly south. <laughs> 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 Move over, Kitty Wells. Deep in a cave with excitement high, the group outstayed its light supply. Gone was the joy, the zest, and the fun as the lights all winked out one by one. There they huddled in bleak despair till the yodeler jumped up and he split the air. He let out his yodel and it echoed off the walls. They used it like radar to guide them through the crawls. Back through the labyrinth, our hero led the way and he yodeled them back to the welcome light of day. That's fine, guys. Uh, that's the end of the Jenny presentation. Give it a hand. <laughs> I would say we'd take questions, but really we would be here all night. So I want to move on to the next part, and that's to the, uh, this one. Uh, so what I want to do, Jared and Galen, is uh, just look at this one for a minute, and then we're going to look at the second slide for a minute. And then we're going to look at video on the third slide. This is here. Mom was here. Uh, I don't know exactly what year it was. It wasn't that long ago. It was six years ago, five years ago. She came. That's me. That's a lot. Oh, that's right. That's Nathan. 
And I think, and I hate to say this, but Ryan, those are Ryan's legs oh, beside Nathan, but it was just, uh, I did cropped it out because I wanted to see mom more. Sorry, sorry, Ryan. I didn't, but that is Nathan. So how old were you then, Nathan, do you think? How old do you look like? How old are you now? What's the, what time? What year do you think this is? Oh, yeah, good. So mom was here, and she, was a, she loved to tell stories. She was a, she was a teacher, um, and I'm not going to talk a lot about her. We're going to see a lot of pictures, but she loved to tell stories, and she had a long career. We're going to see something about her career. After she finished teaching, she volunteered at schools for years and actually won a, a governor's award for volunteering, volunteering, and there's fabulous stories about what she did. But we're not going to go into a lot of stories, but we're going to see this next slide. This is Lower Shuf Upper Shuford, and this is a family reunion of ours we've been having here for many years at uh, Bragg, and that's all our cousins. And this is mom leading the lion hunt, it was one of her famous favorite things to run. And here's a very short video of her leading it. So there's Claire, there's Claire, and Jenny's back over to the left. Ruben's right next, I don't see him. Oh, can you run that one one more time, that video? I think we can see Ruben a little better. There he is. Ruben's right there. Now, right here, listen to how large a crowd was watching this when they laugh when she does the bridge. Listen to the crowd. That's crowd noise. There's a huge crowd there. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to just sit and listen to this. Is This, this uh, music you're going to hear again Friday with the orchestra is going to play this music. This is, oh, could you just wait just one second? Thank you. Um, this is a piano arrangement I made for mom when she was 70. Uh, we're not talking enough about her, I don't think, but uh, that's okay, we'll watch the pictures. When she was 70, she decided she wanted to take piano lessons. She never played music. She was always, you'll see, a handy worker and a mom and a teacher. And so she had a recital, and so I wrote a forehand, uh, well, I took Somewhere Over the Rainbow and arranged it for forehand piano. And I, uh, she play, we played it together on the recital. She played the melody and I played the chords on the bottom. And then just recently, in the last six months or so, I revamped that when we found it recently and uh, revamped it. And, and the performance here is by two by, I uh, uh, just want to say their names, Gail shoot, uh, Gutzall, I think Gutzall, and Faye Adams. They're Suzuki piano teachers. And one day, right after lunch, it's just like this, no time to do anything. And went into a room, they sat down, they ran through it once, and then they, this is the performance. And so the rest of it is just like uh, every five or six seconds, and unless there's something to read, and I'll read it. Okay, so this is uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow with Mom in the pictures. measured not by the breaths we take, but by the moments that take our breath away. Scott on the left, me, dad, 
our sister Berta Jo, Babby, Landon, and Mom. This is Manny's first homeschool kindergarten students with me, age three, in front. This is her school, 28 years. The final home of Jack and Jill School with four dedicated classrooms with 90 students arriving every morning. It's a lawyer's office at this time. Mountain home near Blowing Rock. Manny called it Ta Takasana. It's on 221, still there towards grandfather. So we grew up, our summers were always in Blowing Rock. At that, that cabin. That's my Aunt Nina on the right. That's, that's my mom's older sister, Jenny, dad, and mom. And dad was called Fafa. There was a picnic table on the porch, ping pong table. Devoted sisters, daughters of Van Tyl Hartbian and Bertha Bian, left to right, Jenny, Bettina, and Manny. Manny was known by most as Penny. Bettina was called Nina, and Jenny was Jan. Each one was very unique and incredibly successful in their chosen field. Jenny was well known as a rock climber and cave explorer. Nina was a famous was famous across the world among free market economists. Manny was a loving mom and an innovative teacher, a positive influence on thousands of students and many others. She loved the rocking horse. Linda with, Man Linda with Manny. Teresa. Jim and Jenny. Claire and Manny. Claire's sixth birthday. Cinderella. <laughs> it just okay. This is one of Seth's concerts. Seth and Jenny. <laughs> this is the view for her from her bedroom, one exciting day.